Welcome to this uh, this fourth session of the <clears throat> GLO eHero special sessions on happiness economics. In this session, we have three presenters. We have Paul Penton Villar, we have Mariano Rojas, and we have Ani Tubaji. Um, and in these special sessions, each presenter has a discussant um, who has already read the paper and will give. Uh, in-depth comments on the paper, followed by a general discussion. Um, you have 15 to 20 minutes to present the paper, then there's five minutes for the discussant and five minutes for general discussion. And I will inform you two minutes beforehand um, if you run out of time in your presentation. Um, so we will start with uh, Paul. Well, I need to give you the opportunity to share your screen one moment. Yes, now you should be able to share your screen. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Okay, thank, thank you, Martin. Um, so yeah, so my name's uh, Paul Fenton Villa. I'm a PhD student. Um, at the, uh, in the School of International Development at the University of East Anglia. Um, so today, the, the paper that I'll be presenting um, will be examining if there is a, a mineral-induced uh, economic euphoria, and I'll be using or looking at evidence, uh, looking at data from Latin America. So to give you a, a brief background uh, to this paper, as many of you will know, uh, the mining sector has played a, a significant role in Latin America's economic history, so from the from its uh, colonial history right through to its modern history, and, and even today uh, there's a lot of attention that continues to surround the development of the mineral sector in the region. So it's it's really not very uncommon to see public debates discussing many of the potential benefits of um, mineral extraction in the region. So, for example, many uh, public figures tend to em emphasise the uh, the increased government revenues, the uh, business prospects, the jobs and the foreign investment that the sector can create. And for many people, this is also very compelling. Um, there's various, uh, you know, senior politicians that have campaigned on these issues. Brazil's Bolsonaro, President Bolsonaro, uh, is one of his main, uh, you know, some part of his main uh, campaign trail. Uh, the Argentinian government um, has really called uh, mineral developments in the countries. They, they've they've labelled it a, an economic lifeline for the country. And there's also these kind of more iconic, um, this iconic satire from Mexican cartoonists, which depict the mineral sector as kind of some kind of guardian angel or saviour of the Mexican people. Um, and, and this kind of really... Uh, it illustrates the prevalence of this thinking in, in society uh, in the region. And so this all then builds up to a theory underpinning this study, which relates really to a contemporary stream of thinking um, that highlights the influence this may have on citizens' economic expectations, as well as their satisfaction. So for example, uh, recently, Paul Collier has suggested that the psychological effects of countries' mining activities have inflated many citizens' expectations. And there's also various uh, theoret theoretical models showing that mineral wealth uh, causes an increase in expectations, which in turn uh, drives up an upward shift in individuals' aspirations and has concurrently caused a, a decrease, uh, a, degree, oh, sorry, a degree of uh, dissatisfaction with uh, citizens' current situation. And so really the, the research objectives of, of this paper is twofold. So first is to examine or empirically verify whether there is a positive relationship between the mineral sector and citizens' economic expectations. And then the second is to examine whether we find a, correspond a corresponding uh, decrease in, in satisfaction predicted by, by theory. And so to do this, I'm going to uh, use data from the Latin, uh, Latin Barometer database which provides a, a repeated cross-section uh, survey conducted by national polling firms. It compiles a nationally representative sample from between uh, about 1,000 1, to 1,200 respondents per country per year, and it provides comparable outcome data 
uh, for the study since 2001. And this also includes individuals fr from uh, 18 countries across Latin America, which you can, uh, you can see on the slide. So the outcome variables that I use from this data set um, include the following. So I, I've actually got three outcome variables. Uh, two are related to expectations or economic expectations. So the first one um, questions whether respondents expect changes in the economic situation of their country in the, in the, in the coming 12 months. The second uh, expectations outcome looks at uh, respondents expected changes in the economic set, uh, situation of their personal situation in the coming 12 months. And then finally, the third, the third variable to do with uh, life satisfaction, more simply uh, ask respondents how satisfied they are with their life. So to briefly uh, discuss the identification problem here, if, there, if there's one thing that we've really learned from uh, the last few decades of research or economic research on the mineral sector is that um, mineral production is determined by various unobserved and hard to measure factors. So there's uh, various technological and legal factors that need to be taken into consideration. Um, institutional, societal, economic factors, these all play a role in determining um, mineral production in the region. And this really creates an, an endogeneity problem that's quite difficult to overcome. And it's, it's caused uh, quite a lot of academic debate over the last 20 years as well. However, what we've seen more recently is several studies exploring a promising approach to resolving this issue, uh, where what they've done is they've instrumented countries' mineral rents uh, with their endowment of sedimentary land. Um, so you can see on the right-hand side a, a graph showing uh, some of the data. I've used for the endowment of sedimentary land. Uh, so without going into you know, a whole ge a geological lesson about what sedimentary uh, basins are, but basically this endowment is a, is, is a pre pre prerequisite for the formation of many, many minerals such as coal, oil and metal ores. And so the idea here is that this means that uh, sedimentary basins or the sed sedimentary basin endowment is a, is a time invariant conditionally exogenous factor that can determine uh, prospective mineral endow endowments. And so then the instrumental variable approach is basically assuming that the uh, sedimentary basins will determine your, uh, your production of mineral rents and then uh, by, by definition the instrumental variable assumes that um, the sedimentary basing variable will only affect uh, the outcome variable, say expectations or satisfaction, directly through um, the through through the value of production. However, obviously there there could be concerns here to the instrumental variable approach here, and it's one that I've thought about quite long and hard, quite honestly. Um, and and so one of one of the main concerns here is that actually um, public interest in the extractive sector uh, in sedimentary basins can, can, can occur a long time before uh, the, ex the extraction or production of minerals even starts. So for example, when extractive companies um, start securing commercial licenses and the property uh, required to uh, extract minerals in sedimentary basins, this can directly provoke uh, public attention towards the towards the sector. And what we often see as well is this, this coincides with the early onset of mineral related economic rhetoric in society and uh, uh, among, uh, among politicians as well. So what, what I'm trying to say here is that it, it might not just be the case that sedimentary basings act through production or mineral rents, but there also may be more direct links that aren't being captured as well um, with, with the outcome variable. And as well as this, what, what I also hypothesize here is that um, there could also be a degree of interaction between, uh, between these kind of more direct links with the sedimentary basin variable in the outcome and, um, and, and mineral rents itself. So, for example, quite often extractive companies hold uh, more political clout in the economies that are more dependent on, on mineral sector's rents. And this political clout can allow extractive companies to push their commercial interests higher up the political agenda. And this can also then create um, greater interest in, in the economic rhetoric surrounding the commercial activity 
to secure licenses and rights to develop the, the mineral endowments um, even before production starts. And so then, so then the purpose of the estimation strategy of this paper is really to adapt these recent discussions on sedimentary basins by also uh, considering some of these uh, possibilities of the interaction effects um, that I'm talking about. So here, here what, I, what I'm saying is that the, the estimation strategy that I propose is to go back to the uh, country fixed effects regression and uh, include uh, this kind of interaction term. So the, the fixed effects regression would include the outcome, say expectations, uh, regressed on the mineral rents variable, as well as the interaction between mineral rents and the sedimentary basin variable, as well as potentially some control variables in the vector X. And then I'd include the, uh, the year fixed effects as well as uh, country fixed effects in, in this regression as well. And obviously what we know is that the coefficient beta one, because mineral rents are most likely endogenous, we know that beta one is, is going to be inconsistent but what we've seen from uh, recent developments in the econometric methods literature is that we also know, know now that when you interact an endogenous variable with uh, an exogenous variable, the coefficient of that term, so beta two here, um, is consistent. And so it's this consistency of beta two uh, that I argue can be a basis for the identification of this strategy. Uh, sorry, for the identification of this uh, of this paper. Now we know that there's really in 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 most empirical uh, analysis, there's no such thing as a free lunch. So there's limitations to this strategy as well. Um, so, for example, focusing on the uh, uh, on the uh, variation determined by the interaction term can limit what we might say or might infer about the full marginal effects. Um, so, for example, taking into account both the values of uh, beta one and beta two. However, what I'm trying to argue here is that the interaction effect also provides an important indicator from what we might speculate about the overall marginal effect. Um, and many people that I've been talking to about this, uh, sort of many resource economists, how they've referred to this is that they've referred to kind of beta two as a lower bound estimate of the effects of, of the extractive sector's economic activity. So imagine if uh, beta one was truly equal to zero or, or something like this. And as well as this, I think what's really important to highlight here as well is that previous studies in, in, in this domain have really, have, they've concentrated on, on uh, beta one, right? Um, but if uh, beta two is greater than zero, so if, it's, if, if there is an interaction effect, then what this means is that these previous studies haven't really been showing us a, a, an indication of the full marginal effect either. Um, so what they've done is they've focused on estimating this, this coefficient, but realistically, it could be that there's both uh, a significant effect from both beta one as well as beta two. And my, what my argument is saying, well, rather than focus on the inconsistent, inconsistent parameter of beta one, what if we shift to the um, more consistent parameter beta two that we can estimate as, as an indicator. Um, and, and so, so this, this is the general argument that I'm trying to make with this uh, econometric um, estimation. So taking all, you know, with, with all of these limitations in mind, um, what I'm gonna to present today is just simply the more parsimonious specifications. The actual paper itself has, uh, has far, far more uh, results than I can present today. Um, I have specifications with more control variables, um, different specifications of the mineral rent variable, et cetera. But the, these are kind of the, the broad brush findings from, from the paper. And here, what we're finding is that um, generally the uh, interaction term um, is positive and significantly related with both country expectations as well as um, personal expectations. However, I'm not finding a, a, significant, um, a significant relationship between the interaction term and, um, and life satisfaction. 
Um, so just a brief uh, comment, I guess, to interpret the size of some of the positive, significant positive effects that I'm finding with uh, economic expectations. Um, so we know that a, a one unit change in the interaction term isn't actually a very large change. Um, so, for example, during the commodity, commodity market uh, recovery from the global financial crisis, we see countries such as Venezuela increasing uh, its interaction terms value by approximately 5.6 units um, and annually, effectively. Um, so it, here, what, what I try to do to indicate kind of the magnitude or potential magnitude of some of these effects, if we simulate a, a similar um, a similar increase um, in, in the interaction term, this corresponds with a uh, with a uh, with uh, an odds ratio of an approximately two, meaning that you know, respondents are almost twice as likely to uh, to report an optimistic expectation um, for for country expectations, and uh, for the personal expectations outcome, we see that uh, a, a similar increase in the magnitude of you know five point six uh, units would uh, increase the probability of respondents reporting a more optimistic expectation by approximately sixty three percent. Right, so an odds ratio of 1.63. So just to uh, conclude uh, the, this, I guess, quite brief presentation. Um, so overall, I, I think the results are showing uh, that the magnitude of the effects of the sector on economic expectations may indeed be reasonably significant, particularly during larger episodes of commodity market swings. However, um, I haven't found um, or corroborated uh, the expected significant negative relationship with satisfaction. But we're saying this, I, I think it's worth, it's worth stating that this is really a first line of inquiry into these issues. Um, and I think there's also plenty of op opportunity to um, extend this analysis and, and uh, examine these issues further. Um, so, for example, here I've only looked at relatively short term expectations and other extension might be to do with longer term expectations. Um, here I've looked at uh, data from Latin America, so there could be other geographical reason, uh, regions where, uh, where researchers could extend this analysis, as, as well as um, you know, corroborating these results with different measures of satisfaction, um, potentially in around uh, specific contexts or specific events in the mineral sector might be uh, another another way of um, uh, another way of uh, extending these the, these um, this investigation in, into into these issues. So I just want to take this time to uh, thank you all for listening, and um, I'm more than happy to take any any questions, and would appreciate any comments that anyone has on on the analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Then we will now go to Ani for her discussant comments. Well, thank you very much, uh, Paul, for the very interesting and um, nicely put technical presentation. Um, I haven't read the paper, I have to confess, so my comments will be based on what I just heard. Um, I like it uh, as an approach. I would, uh, think that it contributes a lot uh, to the cultural persistence literature and uh, to the non-linearities in this persistence. So um, this is yet another stream that might be taken into consideration maybe in, in the way that you present uh, what you contribute to. Uh, I was thinking to what extent you can find some kind of an instrument for this endogenous variable that you're talking about and make as a robustness check something which is um, handling it in a different manner. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I think it's very interesting to look at it because uh, based on previous research and based on previous theories, uh, you can expect any direction of the effect. On the one side, you may think that uh, they will have this uh, kind of uh, memory, which will give them um, more psychological self-confidence, self that they will uh, feel entitled this is something on which, uh, in general, the, the class division is uh, so much based. And on the other side, uh, then there is uh, this decline that happens to the mining sector. And then it, this gives them a bigger uh, 
gap in comparison to the current situation. So they will be much easier, much more easily disappointed <laughs> from, uh, you know, failure. Uh, so, yeah, fascinating research, my congratulations. Thanks, Annie. Yeah, there's some uh, really, really interesting comments, I think. I think just, just uh, picking up on kind of the question about the IV, um, I, I think the, the problem the problem that ev every re resource economist has been trying to tackle for the past three decades, probably longer really, um, is trying to find these instrumental variables or some kind of causal, um, you know, exogenous uh, change in, in mineral wealth or mineral rents or something like this. And I think this is this is kind of where, where I've got to in terms of trying to find some kind of, uh, you know, degree of, it's, it's more just finding a degree of variation that we might be able to extrapolate from rather than maybe finding this perfect instrument. And it's kind of the reason why I've gone down this route of looking at maybe an interaction term, which might give us, as I say, an indicator that we can speculate from rather than, you know, this firm is definitely this or it's definitely that. Um, I mean, I'd love to come across an instrumental variable <laughs> um, because I'd probably try and read Well, I was it. thinking of uh, the use of the meridians because the meridians, I understand that it is uh, just for, for one particular location, so it will be limited, but still it is something that you can use. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll have a look into it. Thank you. Um... I saw Mariana raise his hands. Yeah. Yes, I cannot find the the, the hand here in my the screen, but uh, thank you. I, can I make some comments, uh, Martin? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, I'm from Latin America and uh, quite familiar with the, the situation there, the Latino barometer. And uh, my first recommendation would be to, to use the economic satisfaction variables rather than the life satisfaction one. The M. Smith question in the Latino barometer, and also there is an economic situation assessment, which is available every year. Uh, life satisfaction is too big uh, for economic variables to show a relationship between life satisfaction depends on many other things in life. And it would be amazing to find a relationship and that's what you get, no relationship, because it depends on many other things. But if you use the economic situation assessment, which is also subjective, or the end Smith uh, question, probably you will get a better uh, feeling of what is happening there. You know? uh, yeah. the, the second, comment is that uh, usually the discussion in Latin America is about volatility in prices and how this volatility imply uh, that rents go up and down over time. And then you have some inertia. Uh, expectations rise, governments have more revenue, the governments spend more, uh, wages go up in the public sector, then you have prices going down and governments cannot go back and reduce salaries and so on. And then this creates like the, the volatility is the main problem. And this implies a, a time series approach and some lacks and, and trying to understand how volatility ends up affecting uh, expectations, how it ends up affecting economic assessments or life satisfaction, if you want, no? Uh, my third comment is that usually, it is usually important to get some, you mentioned in the beginning, some historical factors, no? But then usually students end up taking the database and applying econometric techniques, advanced econometric techniques and talking about econometric problems. That's okay uh, at the PhD level, but uh, from a knowledge perspective, it may be useful to, to have some knowledge of the political factors uh, in these countries. No, Latin America, you have governments, you have ecological environmental groups there in Ecuador. Uh, a big debate on extraction, the extractive sector, uh, and then to, to provide more contextual perspectives 
will allow you to to go beyond these uh, uh, parameter finders, no parameter estimates, uh, and try to grasp how this extractive sector relates to people's lives, no. Uh, and then that, that's probably more uh, not for your uh, current papers, but future papers that provide better uh, contextual and historical perspective will be very valuable. No, those are my comments. Mm -hmm. Can, do I have the opportunity to potentially discuss this? I'll take those, yes. Um, yes, yeah, so thanks for those comments. They, they're really helpful and I think really insightful as well into um, into the situation and the, you know, the, the real life context behind um, some of these results. And I, I think I uh, I definitely agree that, you know, bring out some of the context of um, why, uh, you know, you know, some of the context of, of what's happening in Latin America is, is definitely um, beneficial for, for a paper. And uh, I think it's something that I do more directly in the paper in terms of explaining, you know, what are some of the debates that are going on, particularly around things like the resource curse and, you know, um, some of the environmental debates and, and things like this that can occur around the extractive, in, uh, around the extractive sector. Obviously, there's two sides of the argument. It's not just uh, econ economically beneficial for for economies, you know, there can be all sorts of externalities also associated and, you know, just purely for time, um, <laughs> I have to, I have to kind of present a, you know, a general um, hypothesis and uh, reasoning for the, for the paper. But yeah, certainly the paper goes into um, more of the contextual issues and some of the context behind some of these, these arguments. And um, I mean, when you say extend to some of the economic situation variables, so looking at some of these economic situation variables in, in the Latin barometer database, they're more asking people, uh, you know, how do you perceive your uh, social economic status, which is something a little bit different to how do you, how satisfied are you with your um, social economic status? So I see there's a slight difference in the variables that are actually available. And absolutely, I'd like to see, or I'd like to use in the future, potentially, if I can find the right kind of database, um, uh, a more proximate uh, satisfaction outcome, say, for example, how, how satisfied are you with your income? Um, but there's also counter arguments to this uh, in the sense that um, income satisfaction isn't the only thing that may be important here. So we, as I say, there may be all sorts of arguments around the environmental factors um, that, that the, that the uh, mineral sector can, can affect. Um, and, and this is why there's also an argument to, to look at so slightly more broader life satisfaction outcomes, as well as, you know, if we can find and get these um, more proximate income satisfaction variables. Here, I, I haven't found precise ones that would be suitable, um, available in Latin barometer. Um, but if, if you think there's something different, I'm happy to go offline and, you know, maybe we can talk about this further um, over email. Um, the, the point around uh, volatility, I think that's actually something that um, is interesting, you know, looking at kind of time series. I've seen some people do this in a, a in a cross country kind of regression as well. Um, I, if anything, I think this is more of an explanation. This inertia argument is more of an explanation for why we might see um, uh, dissatisfaction or um, might not have seen uh, economic expectations increase um, with with rises in. In, uh, in mineral wealth. Um, I think what would have been interesting is to see what what would happen to the results if we looked at the exact same analysis in a previous time period, say in the uh, 80s or the 90s, and then compared the, um, the, the, two, uh, the two time periods, because between the two different time periods, the commodity markets were doing very different things. And um, obviously here, I've only got enough data to look at um, the period since 2001 approximately, so in the last 20 years, um, which isn't quite an, a long enough to be able to look at maybe some of these inertia arguments that I think you're talking about, but definitely something interesting, as I say, for future research. And I think this is just uh, scratching the surface, really, of uh, of the um, of some of these issues. Yeah. So I have a question. So do you think that, the, that your results are generalizable to other contexts, like, for example, other mineral rich places like Africa, or are there particularities in Latin America driving the results maybe? 
So, I, I, you know, one, one of the reasons, uh, I mean, there's a couple of reasons for choosing Latin America for this analysis, but one of the main reasons was that Latin America is a really great testing ground because we know that the debates in Latin America around the mineral sector have been so prevalent. However, obviously, there are other uh, regions of the world that have treated these debates in a slightly different way. And, you know, uh, uh, particularly in Africa, there's, um, there's also prevalent debates around uh, mining. Um, there is research going on in similar types of, of research going on around the uh, African region. Um, do I think that this is precisely generalizable? Could be, um, but still speculation is what I'd say. Um, it's, it, I'd say the results uh, on Latin America are important enough already because of how important the region is and how mineral rich the region is. Um, but still, uh, you know, uh, it would be a speculation to be able to say it generalizes to another region. I think it could do. I think, I, you know, we see a lot of similarities in the in, in the debates between the, the between Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa and even the Middle East. Slightly differently put, but still still similar debates. It would be nice to be able to empirically prove this, but as I say, for potentially for yes. future research. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, okay, then uh, we move. Let me see, there's some comment in the chat. Uh... Uh, Martin, you can skip no. me. I, I wrote it okay. down so that we can move on. Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can uh, discuss in the chat. Okay, so, uh, so we move on to uh, Mariano for his presentation. Yes, thank you. Let me look for my presentation, this one. So uh, you have it? Yeah, we can see the screen, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, okay, this is work in progress and actually it's something new for me. Uh, uh, my, my PhD a long time ago was on industrial organization. So I'm trying to, to combine our happiness research with that, that previous research on industrial organization and theories of the firm. And in this case, I have some colleagues working with me. They are uh, experts in family business and so on. And so what we are doing here is to study uh, entrepreneurs' happiness using what uh, Bernard von Prag calls the anatomy of well-being. No, the anatomy of well-being is trying to understand uh, life satisfaction from uh, domains of life perspective and, and experiences of being well perspective. And we're trying to do this with uh, entrepreneurs, owners and managers of uh, some firms. And uh, our main argument is that there is heterogeneity and that this heterogeneity in the uh, anatomy of well-being uh, translates into heterogeneity in behavior. So we have types, different types of firms, in part because entrepreneurs are different in their explanatory structure of happiness. No, uh, the, the term I'm using here is the explanatory structure of life satisfaction or happiness. And this term refers to the, the relationship between life satisfaction, domains of life, and what we call experiences of being well. No, there is research on uh, affective, evaluative experiences of being well. There is research on domains of life, family life, uh, uh, work satisfaction, so on, and how all these factors relate with life satisfaction. And then you can imagine like a, a, a set of regressions, a system of equations, and the parameters of this system of equation provide this explanatory structure. Those parameters tell us which is the explanatory structure of life satisfaction for a particular group. And our main argument is that there is heterogeneity across persons in this structure, in the parameters, that explain life satisfaction. And you can try to, to study this issue um, in experimental economics. You could study the explanatory structure. You can run a survey to people 
find out how important are different domains of life, how important are different affective evaluative experiences of being well in explaining life satisfaction. And then you can run some experiments on behavior. But we are following a different approach. We, we observe or we rely on studies that state that some entrepreneurs behave differently. Uh, and then we observe different behaviors. And we say, well, maybe these different behaviors uh, uh, take place because the entrepreneurs running these firms have different explanatory structures of life satisfaction. I mean, uh, some domains are more important for some entrepreneurs than for others. Some affective and evaluative experiences are more important for some entrepreneurs than for others. And then when they run their firms, when they manage their firms and take business decisions, they are inclined to behave differently and to lead their firms uh, in different tracks. So that's the main argument. No, um, we know from the from the industrial organization literature that firms uh, are different. They are different in their organization and in their behavior. And there are classifications of firms um, according to, to how they behave, how they organize and so on. And this difference could be explained in part because they face asymmetric constraints. Uh, the context is different. The regulatory framework is different. They face different union uh, norms, structures, or they could be different because those leading the firms have different goals. And then we will emphasize the second factor, different goals, different um, factors that entrepreneurs value. You know? uh, and we have here literature that tells us that family firms are different than non-family firms. Uh, family firms are defined as firms that emphasize uh, transgenerational succession intentions. Uh, there is family involvement, family control, and the literature tells you that they have non-financial goals. Uh, in family firms, profits are not so relevant. Uh, family control is central, uh, and family influence and family succession, uh, keeping the founder's values, uh, which in most cases is grandpa, grandma, no? Uh, this firm was created by grandpa, and then we want to keep those values uh, uh, in the firm. Uh, and the literature emphasizes that family and emotional considerations play an important role. So it's not only about profits, but it's about family and about emotions. And there is a huge literature uh, explaining the role of family and emotional considerations and how these affect the behavior of firms. Uh, the non-family firm, uh, in this case, is any firm that is an that is not a family firm. No? So we have the rest. We are comparing here those family firms with those non-family firms. And what we want to, uh, to, to study is whether they are different because those leading the firms have different explanatory structures of life satisfaction. Um, the, the hypotheses are quite simple, as you will see. No. Um, we assume that entrepreneurs, like anybody else, aim at greater happiness. So uh, if you are an entrepreneur, if you own a, a firm or you lead a firm, you want to be happy. Uh, you take your business and non-business decisions in such a way to, to maximize or to increase your happiness. Uh, of course, sometimes you do not control everything, but in this case, uh, if you are a major owner, you have some degrees of freedom to pursue those business decisions that contribute the most to your happiness. No? 
So business decisions are framed within a major life strategy. Uh, you do not care so much about profits, but about maximizing happiness because you are the owner or a major shareholder, you have some degrees of freedom to, to take those actions that maximize your life satisfaction. Uh, we say that you are thinking in terms of a life portfolio where the business is just one of the elements in your life, also the family, also your health and so on. And within your constraints, you aim at greater happiness. And if different entrepreneurs, uh, if entrepreneurs have different explanatory structures of happiness, then they will be inclined to take different business decisions when they are maximizing or when they are aiming for greater happiness. So we have basically three hypotheses. The first one is that um, entrepreneurs in family and non-family firms have different explanatory structures of happiness. Um, the domains of life uh, explanation is different. The importance of some um, affective evaluative experiences is different. And then what we observe is that if family considerations are more important in family firms, it may be because the family domain is more important for these entrepreneurs in family firms. And if affective experiences uh, are more important, then affective considerations are also there, no? In uh, the, the importance of the explanatory structure of happiness. Mm -hmm. So we ran a survey in Spain. Uh, it's difficult to interview CEOs, uh, and we will manage to interview more than 200 CEOs. We took those who were major shareholders, more than 25% of, of the company, no? And then we are working with this notion of entrepreneurs who are owner managers. They are major owners and they manage the firm. So they take the business decision, they face the consequences of these decisions, and they keep in mind that what they want is to maximize their happiness. Profits, from the firm are just one of the elements in their life, but it's not everything. Also being in an harmonious situation with your brother, with your um, uh, father is also important. And if this is business related, then you are willing to take some decisions in the business that maximize your family satisfaction, even at the expense of profits. So that's, that's more or less the, the general approach, no? Uh, we use a classification of firms as family and non-family, which is a standard in Spain. It's based on, on a major methodological uh, development by the Spanish Institute of Family Business. And we run the survey to get information on life satisfaction of these entrepreneurs satisfaction in four domains of life, family, work, economic, and health. I uh, will not get into the details and some experiences of being well. Uh, the evaluative experience, more cognitive oriented is based on Ed Diner's satisfaction with life scale. Uh, positive and negative effect comes mostly from the Gallup World Poll thriving approach, no? We ask about frequency in the experience of some positive and negative emotions. And we are incorporating a sensory experience, more hedonic in the sense of a, a being tired, physical discomfort. You know? uh, this is the basic information. And then we study the explanatory structure of entrepreneurs in family and non-family firms. And we expect this structure to be different. Uh, what do we find? First, in terms of levels, um, there are no major differences between family firm entrepreneurs and non-family firm entrepreneurs. 
uh, life satisfaction is more or less the same. Family satisfaction is more or less the same. In fact, we run tests to study whether there are differences or not, and there are no difference. But I would like to emphasize that this is not the main goal of the paper, it's not to study levels in satisfaction. The main goal is to study the explanatory structure, the role that the family, the work, the economic and the health domains play in explaining life satisfaction and the role that the experience of being well play in explaining satisfaction in domains of life. So this is just descriptive statistics. And what we want to know is basically this. Are there differences in the domains of life explanation of life satisfaction between family firm and non-family firm entrepreneurs? And as you can see, we find that uh, those family firm entrepreneurs, the life satisfaction of family firm entrepreneurs is highly sensitive to family satisfaction. This makes sense. They care a lot about family satisfaction. If family satisfaction declines, they will suffer a lot. And that implies that when they are managing their firms, they take into consideration how these business decisions will affect my family satisfaction. That's why uh, the family firm is more sensitive to family considerations. They do not care so much about work satisfaction, but work satisfaction is very important for non-family firm entrepreneurs. They are there because they take their business decision taking into consideration how this is going to affect my work satisfaction. Am I going to enjoy doing this or not? So we have different entrepreneurs. They are all entrepreneurs, but they are different in the importance that domains of life have in explaining their life satisfaction. And then they are inclined to take different decisions. They ponder differently the, the role of the repercussions that business decisions have on family satisfaction, work satisfaction, and even economic satisfaction. There are no differences across entrepreneurs in health satisfaction. And this makes sense. Health satisfaction uh, depends on other factors. No? But, uh, and now let's go deeper. We run a seemingly related regression and we get into how family satisfaction, work satisfaction, economic satisfaction and health satisfaction relate to the uh, experiences of being well. These uh, dinner satisfaction with life scale, positive effect, negative effect, and we find out whether they are different or not. Uh, you can see that family satisfaction which is very important for family firm entrepreneurs, depends heavily on positive and negative effect. This explains why affective considerations are very important in family firms. When entrepreneurs in family firms are taking business decisions, of course, they care about the affective repercussions from their business decisions. This is not what you get in the other firms. So in general, I, I will not get into the other domains. There are differences, but in general, you get this idea. Uh, entrepreneurs in family firms, uh, the life satisfaction of entrepreneurs in family firms is highly sensitive to family satisfaction and their family satisfaction is highly sensitive to affective considerations. And this explains why their business decisions are different than those in non-family firms. So in general, uh, the, 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 the preliminary conclusions we have is that uh, there is heterogeneity. Not all entrepreneurs are equal in their explanatory structure of life satisfaction. This explanatory structure may be uh, useful to understand why family firms 
behave differently than non-family firms. And in general, it may be useful to explain why some people behave differently than other people. And this allows us to understand uh, why some, business, some firms uh, take into consideration non-monetary goals, such as the repercussions in the family satisfaction, uh, the repercussions in negative emotions for our entrepreneurs. Uh, there are some, uh, I'm not so much interested in the CEOs or entrepreneurs, but on the heterogeneity across groups. I think that uh, we have run many studies on domains of life, but we usually assume that uh, the, the explanatory structure is homogeneous across people. No, we run a regression analysis and we say everybody has the same explanatory structure. And what we find here is that there may be heterogeneity across people. Some people may be more sensitive to family matters than others. And this will imply that their decisions in life are different. No? And so in general, we would like to, to study, this is what we call, uh, what is that, that that people value that is more important for their life satisfaction. And so we would like to go beyond uh, entrepreneurs to study this uh, in other groups um, and to understand why people have different explanatory structures, why the family domain is more important for some people than for others, why working is more important for some people than for others and so on. Uh, as I told you, this is work in progress, so your comments, recommendations will be highly welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mariano. Um, do you have discussion comments, uh, Paul? Um, so this is this is the first time I'm seeing the material like much of you. So um, okay. uh, I mean, I'm I've, I've got a couple of comments. I'm I'm not sure I have fully thrashed out my uh, perceptions on the paper yet, but um, maybe some comments that I can put out there, and someone else can build on if they have any similar thoughts. Um, so my first thought really was how comparable these family and non-family, or the people that are running these family and non-family businesses are, and whether this really makes a meaningful comparison or not. Um, I, I just wasn't quite sure on that point. Maybe you can kind of explain that a little bit further in, in your comments. Um, and the, uh, the other point that I'm still kind of thinking about is more to do with this kind of causal ordering of, is it life satisfaction that's affecting uh, family satisfaction or is it family satisfaction affecting uh, life satisfaction and which one of these two drives you to be a family business owner as opposed to uh, a non-family business owner and th this type of thing. I don't know whether the, the work could do with some sort of theor theoretical model. I mean, this is an economics paper, um, you know, just kind of really thrashing out some of the proofs behind the concepts that you're trying to convey. Um, it's, uh, I, I've never seen anything quite, as you're saying, quite the same. I, I kind of get the general, uh, sorry, the same as, as, as what you've presented. I, I get the general gist of what you're trying to argue, but um, yeah, I, I don't know whether there's some sort of theoretical model that could really underpin this, which would cement the ideas a little bit further in that. Would you like to respond, Mariana? Uh, thank you, Paul, and uh, I apologize. Uh, I, I did not send the paper. Uh, uh, actually, I forgot. I've been on vacation. It's August, uh, and um, I completely forgot. So sorry about that, Paul. Uh, and le let me go first to the second issue. That, that's a very relevant issue uh, in the literature. Uh, whether domains of life explain life satisfaction or whether the overall assessment of life satisfaction explains domains of life. Um, there are some people, uh, good friends, uh, Ruth Van Hoven. Uh, he is a, a, a believer of what he calls the top-down approach. Uh, life satisfaction, people have a general assessment of I'm um, doing good, and then they translate this to the domains. No? 
uh, and that's a top down. The causality goes from a general assessment to the domains of life. And we have people uh, who believe that it is a bottom up. Myself, you know, uh, I'm a bottom up uh, enthusiastic. And my explanation is that if this is top down, then you would expect um, that, that people with the same top level will end up having the same bottom levels. And this is not what you find. But, but that's a, there is a huge debate. Uh, Ruth and myself, we have always discussed about this. Uh, and there is a good paper by Saris. Um, Saris, uh, that's an old paper with some econometric techniques. And we are trying to replicate that paper to show that he, he says, uh, Saris, who is a good econometrician, says we cannot uh, reach a conclusion. We don't know. Uh, my personal belief is that causality is, in the end, a matter of theory, not of econometrics. But that's a different issue. It's how you understand the world. You can run econometrics to see some variables uh, precede other variables. But precedence is not causality. Causality is more a conceptual concept. Uh, and there is debate there, no? Uh, uh, it's a major point always. Causality is a major point. And uh, in this literature, you have the bottom up with root uh, and some followers behind and uh, the, the top down with root and the bottom up with uh, other experts, no, in the air. The, the second point about comparison, I'm not clear whether you mean that you cannot compare the reports uh, of entrepreneurs in family and non-family firms, or what you mean is that family and non-family firms are different. Okay. I, I, I don't hear. No, we don't hear you, Paul. Uh, sorry. Uh, so I, I think I was more uh, more moving towards the second of of the two. Um, I, I don't, I, I didn't explicitly think that you were trying to precisely compare the two types, but they do seem like quite different categories of business. And I, I, I didn't, I wasn't clear as to whether it was meaningful to show both. Oh, um, okay. Yes. Yes. Probably a, a major issue there is why they are different. Uh, uh, if they have entrepreneurs, if they are business, if they are firms, why they are different. Different in how they organize their business, different in how they take decisions. Some are more inclined to internationalize than others, to go to the stock market than others, to ask for money from banks, uh, loans than others. Why they are different? Uh, that's what actually what we are trying to understand. And or argument is that probably they are different because people behind them are different in their explanatory structure of happiness. Uh, because some people in life care more about family. Other people are more sensitive. Their, their life satisfaction is more sensitive to work satisfaction. And then if they are different in the importance of domains of life and experiences of being well, they end up building and managing different firms. Uh, probably that's how we are trying to, to explain this. Mm -hmm. hmm. I will ask a question, Mariana. Um, and maybe I've misunderstood, but can it be that um, these effect measures that you show, so negative and positive effects, relate more strongly to family satisfaction in family businesses, simply because these people spend more of their time with family. So it's just a time spending thing. Like it's close, more closely related, these emotional experiences and family satisfaction because they spend more time with family. Yes, uh, 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 and it is not only time spent, it's that you grow up within a family that has 
different values. They take you to, uh, your grandpa takes you to, to the, the business when you are a kid, no? Uh, and then you associate the business with your grandpa. And the values that they emphasize are the family values. Uh, that's a major issue. We find that they have different explanatory structures. Now we want to know why. Is this nurturing? Is this education? Is this the values? Is this because you are attached to your parents? What happens when your parents are absent? No? Uh, are there life events like divorce or like uh, uh, being fired? Uh, that change your explanatory structure. That's what we would like to understand in the long run, no? No, not for this paper, but in the long run, we need more time series to understand uh, how this explanatory structure emerge and how the, it changes over time. Yeah, so you cannot flesh out, uh... Um, for example, this time spending versus attachment versus other kind of more subjective uh, things, yeah. Because that would be interesting to, to really see why this occurs. Okay, uh, Kelsey has a question. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Mariano. Uh, always a pleasure to see your talks. Um, so it related to just what Martin was saying, I was thinking about you may have a lot more firm characteristics. Um, and then, you know, so if you can compare those who work in firms, say, with their spouse, uh, with siblings, with parents, uh, with, with those that don't, that might help address Martin's question. And I was thinking prior to that, uh, also other firm behavior. I imagine this is part of where you're going. So firm size, uh, you know, whether or not they are um, making more or less money. So it'd be... Interesting to say, okay, within family owned firms, and then you've got heterogeneity, uh, you know, of characteristics of the managers. So do managers that put more emphasis on family satisfaction earn lower profits? Um, you know, that seems like a, a natural hypothesis. So it, it'd be, so I, I'd like to see the next step. I, I, and I think it's a really interesting way to understand the motivations of the managers. So I, I really like the approach uh, and it'd be, I'd like to see what you, what you do with it uh, when you add in these form characteristics. Um, may I respond quickly? Yes, uh, Kelsey, thank you. Um, we, we have some data on uh, who else is in the family. And then we are running some constellations, family constellations. Uh, you have your your father-in-law in the family, in the business, no? You have three brothers. Uh, we have that constellation, uh, and that's uh, uh, another paper. And something very interesting is that we have information on subjective value of the firm, which is basically we ask them, are you willing to sell this firm at market value, or how much would you ask? And those who have lower family satisfaction are more willing of selling the firm, uh, which means that it is not just profits no, or financial value of the firm. It's the subjective value that depends on whether this firm is providing family satisfaction or not. So uh, there are some papers in the oven, no, but... Uh, Let's see what we get in the future. And I would not like to, to stick to entrepreneurs. I think this applies to other persons in life, you know, and regular persons. We see different paths in life. People take, you were in California, now you are in Luxembourg, and you probably you decide to stay there. And I wonder, well, maybe your explanatory structure of life is different than somebody who decided to stay in California, no? uh, the, the, uh, to apply this to other areas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mariano. Uh, then we go to our final presentation uh, by Ani. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be with you. I'm very 
happy and proud to be part of the e heroes <laughs> and uh, it was really interesting everything that uh, i listened to i liked very much the presentation of marian there are some things with perhaps the selection that can be more um, carefully interpreted in terms of what you get because you said that uh, the people that you um, uh, kept as entrepreneurs are people who also became um, direct managers of the business so there, there's there might be something specific about them. Uh, and I was thinking that there is yet another pocket of uh, heterogeneity. Of course, you can never stop with the heterogeneity. It can always go on and on, but it is interesting to know what were their aspirations. Because I may love very much my family and I may very much love my uh, grandpa, by the way, every time you said it, I was thinking of my grandpa. But um, then I may commit to it because of the family, but I might have had different kind of aspirations. So this may, if you have a question for this, it will be interesting to, to see what you will say. And before starting to present my thing, I want to apologize for two things. I also forgot to send it, uh, not because I wasn't with it, but because I had to prepare three special sessions. I a little bit overstretched myself for another conference which runs in parallel. So and I'm now tired and also freshly jumped so it might be a little bit fuzzy, <laughs> but I'll try to keep my concentration to, to give you a consistent uh, story now. Uh, so. Do you see my presentation now? Yes. All right. This is a paper that um, I have written with uh, a very nice uh, friend of mine now. It was uh, a student of mine uh, two years ago, uh, who was a very enthusiastic um, collector of data. So uh, the paper took several iterations. We were searching for the best data set and we again ended up with the data set that he collected because it has a very nice experimental structure. And we know a lot about it because we already have a paper. Uh, written with this data set and taking into consideration all the dependencies that exist in the data, so we know the data. Uh, and we wanted to, to uh, use it uh, for addressing three problems, which um, uh, from my standpoint should be uh, very clear as existing, but for some surprising reason they seem to be neglected in the literature. Which are these problems? The first is that um, human consumption of just about anything uh, factors in the cultural component uh, of uh, this product being created by a human being. And of course, everything that is surrounding us now uh, is um, part of human production, but this understanding of the cultural value congelated in the uh, human production, our time congelated in, in uh, in what we produce is um, a very basic argument in Marx. So it is surprising this to be forgotten when we start talking about uh, goods and services produced by other kinds of uh, agents, that these agents will be um, uh, of a different nature and then there will be a cultural distance between the producer and uh, us. And put in different more human terms, well, uh, if something is, if a painting is produced by a person who has uh, put there his time and his emotion, you will think of this painting in a different way uh, than um, an identical uh, painting produced by a machine. Just because the machine is just technically uh, delivering something without the cultural human pr proxy, uh, the human proximity uh, containing um, uh, element, uh, you cannot empathize with the machine, you can empathize with the person who, who is uh, putting his um, uh, emotional experience in the uh, canvas. Uh, and, and this um, uh, aspect of the proximity might be taken into consideration in some marketing research, but there um, the question will be from the point of view how we make this product then be closer and closer to the experience which um, assimilates the, the human experience, while the, the experience with things produced by humans. Uh, while um, the bottom line of what I'm um, talking about is that 
uh, no matter what the specifications of the product will be, it will always remain, uh, as long as it's salient who produced it, it will always remain a clear distinction of zero one, is it a human or is it not a human uh, product. Then um, uh, this thing uh, will also factor uh, very importantly uh, in the way that uh, artificial intelligence will matter um, for uh, the economic development because uh, we may have um, the efficiency of these new products which are running with uh, AI algorithms to be higher, but if people simply do not want them <laughs> that much because of this cultural distance, then the demand side uh, will not be factored in. Uh, on the overall effect of AI on the development of the economy. So there will be sort of a AI bubble and over expectation that because of the increased efficiency, uh, there will be this um, great impact of the artificial intelligence. And in, in reality, uh, the economy will uh, be affected much less uh, from it and maybe even negative if uh, there is a backlash of people. And um, then there is a third aspect which is um, the use of algorithms, uh, AI algorithms, both for research and for um, uh, business analytics. And in both cases, uh, there is an uh, over excitement uh, with the precision, increased precision and efficiency of these uh, estimators. And it seems like <laughs> for, for some reason, people forget that this is just one more estimator no matter what is um, the, the structure of it, uh, what uh, drives your estimations being really valuable and reliable and non-biased is the quality of your data and the quality of your model, which is way more important. Uh, in the sense, you may have fantastic data and big data, but if, if it still uh, does not rely on a, on a good model, uh, there you go, you have underspecified uh, situation biased estimates. Uh, and and I, this is absolutely obvious. Uh, I would say, uh, not that it's not recognized, but somehow it is very much in the corner of uh, the discussion, like, oh, it's obvious. Uh, and then uh, there is this um, insistence or on introduction of um, business analytics, which are using uh, artificial intelligence. And then um, what is uh, the actual uh, value added of these uh, business analytic tools in comparison to the normal consultancy which was taking uh, place before uh, is uh, quite um, dubious, not to mention that this might very well be seen uh, even in the research field papers produced with using glass or using uh, uh, random forest. And then, um, you know, the overexcitement uh, with uh, the gain of precision. And uh, as always, forgetting that you're a CIA. So uh, this paper will showcase uh, these three problems uh, in a way which is simple, but uh, simple enough simply to make it obvious and undeniable and put it on the table as one thing to be discussed and not forgotten. Uh, how we will do that? Uh, so we will look uh, in specific um, uh, how um, the um, uh, emotional connection with uh, the value of being human plays a role um, uh, in the valuation of music. So this data set that uh, Horan uh, gathered um, created uh, two pieces uh, of uh, music which used artificial intelligence algorithms and uh, had um, counterfactual pieces of so the one was um, a classical piece of music created by AI, the other was a modern piece of music created by AI. And then we had a classical and contemporary piece of music um, created by human beings. And uh, these four pieces of music were offered to people. They uh, evaluated uh, the quality of the music according to the standard uh, five criteria in music theory. And then we get a lot of information about the people themselves, uh, what kind of music they like, the demographic characteristics, and uh, further uh, details. I'll show you the data in a bit. And uh, then they were informed uh, that uh, sample two and sample four were actually generated by artificial intelligence, and they were re-invited to, um, again, evaluate uh, the music according to the same criteria. Uh, and in a, another paper, uh, which recently came out in uh, Technological um, Frontiers and Social Change, um, we uh, showed the, the effect of this uh, treatment 
of um, additional piece of information uh, where all the criteria, objective criteria of the product uh, remain the same and how the hedonic valuation of people uh, is uh, quite uh, um, uh, sensitive to this uh, new piece of information. They, they um, re-evaluate uh, um, uh, the, um, uh, the piece uh, in very non-linear ways, which however are possible to be identified with certain characteristics of the people. And so there is a lot of nonlinearity. There is a lot um, of uh, information that is hidden if the model does not uh, assume that there is an importance of being human in it. And uh, uh, also if, uh, uh, of course, uh, the, the provision of information uh, does not um, uh, get uh, factored uh, into the model. So what we wanted to see is what will an artificial intelligence um, classifier do if we just give him the, or it, the data um, about uh, the characteristics of the music and how much people like this uh, music and then substitute um, uh, the same uh, independent variables but uh, give them together with uh, the final result after uh, the information uh, was provided by the people but artificial intelligence will not know that. So here you have, in the second ca case, you have uh, an omitted variable uh, case. In the, in the first um, uh, instance, there will be uh, uh, a mission uh, due to... Annie, sorry to interrupt. Uh, were you intending to advance your slides? We are not seeing the slides being advanced. Now? Uh, now we, we see the third slide highlighted. You're not in presentation mode, but we can see the slides. Oh. Um, okay, now, yes. Oh, sorry about that, I, I didn't know. Oh, well, just nicely nestling to your story. Uh, okay, uh, so um, the literature uh, itself on, uh, on the role of um, the human variation uh, of um, uh, cultural proximity uh, in the consumer uh, utility function uh, can be divided in uh, sort of three big uh, sections. The cognitive sciences, which want to uh, see how to make um, the artificial intelligence more like human. Uh, so they're trying to understand it, uh, hoping to substitute the specifications uh, of a human with the specif specifications of an artificial intelligence. Then there is the psychological and uh, neuroscience uh, aspect, which uh, looks way more um, into this um, uh, cultural uh, evaluation um, elements. Um, they look at um, the emotions, but uh, the emotions um, are only part of the story. Then the emotions are filtered through a cultural um, uh, perception for the trigger. And only then they're transformed into feelings. So only then people uh, have a certain preference uh, according to what uh, they, they were triggered for and they saw. So the problem for artificial intelligence is that it tries to mimic people by looking at uh, what the trigger is and how people behave. And they have no idea what is happening after the fear or pain has been <laughs> um, uh, aroused uh, uh, in them. The machine has no idea what is the cultural filter uh, through which um, uh, things uh, are um, reinterpreted uh, into feelings. And this is not uh, taken into consideration in the economic literature, which has managed uh, through very long path of evolution uh, to uh, integrate um, the role of emotions, but not really the role of feelings in the decision-making process. And we are talking here about the feeling. Uh, now, uh, the artificial intelligence literature with regards to services in specific um, uh, has managed to, to figure out that uh, these feelings do matter, so especially the feelings of trust. Um, this has been done uh, both for self-driving cars and for music in different ways. So in a sense, uh, they realize that they have to decrease the efficiency of the performance uh, of uh, um, the algorithm in order to make people like better uh, the music or um, trust more uh, their uh, you know, GPS system. So um, uh, the other thing which um, was quite interesting is that having one and the same experience uh, in terms of the interruption of a service um, was um, according to how uh, whether pe people perceived it uh, as um, 
a fair and an avoidable problem or an irritable problem created by the provider, uh, the absolutely uh, same identical initial experience uh, was leading to a completely different behavior in terms of complaints or um, just uh, you know, complacent uh, uh, neglecting the, the, the case. So all these things show that um, there, there, there is this uh, feeling component and it definitely will uh, play part. And then our question is whether the black box of artificial intelligence with its super precision is able to compensate um, for the inaccuracy in terms of modeling uh, this uh, feeling component, the integrity function of the consumer. So this is how this looks um, graphically. Of course, if you are a person who is a psychologist, this is uh, super obvious and like um, finding out the hot water, but for an economist, this is something which is just all crammed into, uh, well, somehow divided between emotions and preferences. Uh, the data that we have uh, is, uh, I would say, not bad in, uh, the, in one way. In another way, uh, it is, uh, of course, not big data. So we have uh, 957 respondents. When you multiply this uh, by four cases, we have something like uh, 4,000 observations. So you will have um, for the uh, training and so on um, a sizable proportion of something like um, if you take the two, two third of the data, then you have uh, sufficient to observations also to compare afterwards the, the one third will be something like 1000 something observations. Uh, so uh, for, the, for the random forest uh, exercise. So um, it is not a small uh, data set, but in the same time, it's a realistic data set. And here is the claim that we are making um, uh, for the usefulness um, or uselessness of artificial intelligence and its efficiency in research, because especially I'm a regional economist. So if you're doing research uh, on individuals with big data, okay, you, you have many, many observations with no problem. But if you are anyhow to make sense of these people and where they're located, then the locations will never be that many in, in the thousands, okay? <laughs> so then for a regional analysis, an artificial intelligence uh, estimator will lose uh, its uh, um, you know, value added. Uh, in, in a very big um, uh, extent, just because of the nature of the data that this analysis can um, use. Um, but I'm doing also micro work, so I'm not completely uh, rejecting that with big data you can do something interesting, of course, but uh, just there are limitations that have to be taken into consideration. Um, then uh, we have uh, all these uh, controls related to the demographics and um, uh, what type of music the person um, uh, likes to, to listen, whether there is experience in the family uh, of uh, listening music, whether he's a professional musician or no uh, himself. Uh, and um, uh, then uh, these are the um, uh, criteria, so coherence, melodicity, harmony, uh, rhythm, and the overall um, uh, uh, um, overall um, uh, appeal of uh, the piece. And uh, they're all uh, evaluated on Likert scale from one to uh, 10, and then we know um, the artificial intelligence nature of um, the uh, composer. So uh, here what you see is um, how um, uh, the, the distribution looks like according to the different types of uh, music and different um, types of uh, composers. And um, uh, I, I, actually this is the, the, um, the reported satisfaction or the, the reported uh, liking that the people expressed about the music. Uh, and as you see, uh, the mm, these nonlinearities that I told you get somehow lost. So it looks like there is not too much change, but from the previous paper, we already know that actually the people who are here in the peak are no longer forming this peak here. And the data itself, however, neutrally looks distributed very much the same way. So I would think by looking already at this thing that uh, artificial intelligence will remain completely clueless about what's going on because the distributions look <laughs> quite uh, similar. Of course, it depends uh, on the relationship of these uh, things with the explanatory variables, but um, uh, well, that's quite a misleading uh, starting point I would, uh, I would expect. What's going on now? 
I cannot go further. Do you see me going further? Yeah, I think I moved. Um, so um, if you want to see whether there is some kind of uh, relationship between uh, the uh, pre and post evaluation of the music for the uh, AI uh, generated uh, musical uh, compositions, uh, there seems to be some uh, relationship, but as you see, these dots are very far away from the line, so I wouldn't put too much enthusiasm into how they look like. And uh, what we want to do is to estimate, so in the previous paper we used sufficient um, uh, advanced techniques and so it's hard to be convinced that the OLS definitely does not do a very good job in understanding who likes what. Uh, so starting with the premise that we know that OLS is really not doing well for explaining this particular data, not, not per se, but in particular, definitely and for sure. Uh, then let's compare whether Lasso and Random Forest can do better than the OLS. And uh, obviously, since I'm starting from here, you will um, uh, expect to know that uh, uh, both Lasso and Random Forest per <laughs> perform worse than the OLS. Or equally uh, bad as it in, in, in the different cases, different specifications. So um, we don't really gain anything with, and while Lasso and the Random Forest, Lasso is one of the most um, easy to implement uh, procedures and uh, Random Forest is one of the best uh, possible, again, accessible uh, estimations for, for this kind of data. So um, in a sense, Random Forest is a higher rank than uh, Lasso, but it uh, doesn't really uh, make a difference for the ultimate uh, outcome. And the argument is that we're testing whether AI is um, able to look at the customer satisfaction and the um, um, human uh, intelligence having this component of cultural value uh, being actually fixed, so not observing it as anything playing a role in the decision-making process, why, while actually it does, and when it changes, does artificial intelligence can do uh, just about anything uh, to predict um, uh, properly uh, the choice and behavior of um, uh, people um, given this change. Why am I stuck in values? So um, here is the first estimation with the lasso. So here you have the OLS, and then uh, the OLS before the information is given to the people, then the lasso uh, for uh, the same uh, piece of music. Now, then the information is given to the people, you have uh, again uh, the OLS, and then you have the lasso. And then the same repeated for the other piece of music. And the only thing which I uh, really uh, would like to comment here is uh, the most simple, but <laughs> in the end of the day, most relevant. Uh, what is uh, the goodness of fit of um, the overall estimation uh, when you look at uh, the R square achieved? And um, first of all, they're consistent more or less in the way that they select the, the important um, variables that determine the process. But uh, also what is um, interesting is that no matter whether you use a stupid OLS or a lasso a procedure, you'll end up with the same explanatory uh, success in the end of the day with your model and your data. And uh, uh, if you go into the case when there is the omitted variable of the treatment effect, the, of course, the um, um, explanatory uh, power will be lower. And what, what is funny is that it is uh, much lower for the lasso than uh, it is uh, for, um, uh, for, the, um, for the OLS. So this the, the third and the fourth specification. And Two then, minutes. Uh, yeah, I, I don't really have uh, way too much. Well, I have my, but I can very easily fit into it. And then um, uh, you do the same uh, here. You have some kind of a better performance of lasso in the second case, but nevertheless, if you compare it um, uh, with um, uh, the, um, the with um, uh, the um, uh, case before information was given, still uh, the lasso cannot compensate for the omitted variable um, uh, bias. So it, it remains something like uh, 10 um, 
apart. Apart. So here this is just uh, to, to show you that not that uh, it uh, remains completely coolless, uh, it always tries to adjust the, the model and the adjustment is quite big in terms of uh, lambda, the lasso, so it is not uh, completely insensitive to the fact that there was this um, nonlinearity and these changes, but it does manage to compensate it uh, in a sufficiently successful manner. 